I'm going to sketch a Nyquist plot here for a transfer function. So let's look at the loop transfer functions. k over s times s squared plus s plus 6. So in order to sketch the Nyquist plot, first we're going to draw the pole zero map. So I haven't found the exact roots of the s squared plus s plus 6, but I know they're not on the j omega axis. But there is one s that's on the j omega axis. So I'm going to have to draw a contour around that point. And I choose to draw it to include that point. So this is my drawing in the s plane. And I'm going to go ahead and label a few points here. A, B, C. So these three points follow the contour as it moves around the point that's at the origin. And I'm also going to label a point D. I don't know D's exact value, but E's value is J infinity. And I'll figure out D's value as we're going. The values for A, B, and C are all some value epsilon and then whatever the angle happens to be. So epsilon angle 180 will be A, and epsilon angle 135 is B, and epsilon angle 90 is C. So I write epsilon both ways. Either I write it looking like an E, or sometimes I write it using the actual Greek-looking letter epsilon, just in case you're wondering throughout, hey, why did he write that? epsilon differently? Is it a different variable? No, sometimes I just forget which way I wrote it before. Okay, so we've drawn our contour now in the S plane. So now we're going to draw the contour in the L of S plane. So this is how the contour varies as we put it through the function L of S. So we're going to take each of these points, A through E, and plot them, and then we're going to draw the contour between them. So if we look at L of A, the value that we use here for Epsilon is actually minus epsilon. Uh, and I actually have a little error here. Let me fix this. So this is minus ep epsilon squared minus epsilon plus 6. So k over minus epsilon, because we substitute that value in for s. The minus epsilon squared is just epsilon squared. And then minus epsilon plus 6. So this value works out to be at minus k times infinity because... This value here inside the parentheses is just 6 plus a really small number. And so we have 6 times minus epsilon under k. So it's minus k infinity. OK. So now let's look at where b is going to show up. So here we substitute epsilon angle 135. And as we do this, we see that, again, we get 6 plus two really small numbers times epsilon angle 135. So essentially we have k over epsilon angle 135, which is going to be infinity angle minus 135, because we'll subtract away this value. So because the angle 135 is in the denominator, that becomes a negative value when we calculate the phase of the resulting value of L of a b. So b prime is some value k times infinity, which will still be infinity at the angle of minus 135. So here's b prime. So c. c is at j epsilon, or epsilon angle 90 degrees. So we have a similar kind of situation here, epsilon angle 90 in the denominator, times a really big real number plus some imaginary numbers. So the, the really small imaginary numbers won't matter as much as the really big number when it comes to establishing the final value. So we have, again, k times infinity, angle minus 90, because the 90 is in the denominator. So here's where c prime is. So that gives us our a prime, b prime, and c prime. That tells us how we're going to be moving at the radius, the arc of infinity here. But what we don't know is where are we going to cross the real axis in the L of s plane. So that's going to tell us what our margin is. And that's the value d that we see denoted here on our uh, on the s-plane drawing. So our s-plane contour, we're now going to want to find out what is this point d at which we only have real values. And so in order to do that, I substitute j times d, because I don't know what d's magnitude will be, but I know that it'll be at jd, so it'll be d angle 90. Um, so I'll go ahead and substitute this in. I multiply through jd squared plus jd plus 6, so now I'm going to get in the denominator, after multiplying this JD into the parentheses, 
minus jd cubed plus d squared plus j60. So I'll keep all the j terms together. And I end up with now the ability to have only a real or imaginary piece by finding the part of this equation that is equal to zero. So if I can make j times zero, then I'm going to have only a real component at k over minus d squared. So that happens at a value of 6d minus d cubed equal to zero. So the values where this happens are d equal to zero and plus or minus square root of six. So that tells us that for those values of d, d square root of six and, uh, sorry, j square root of six and minus j square root of six, that we're going to be crossing the real axis. So if I substitute in either square root of six or minus square root of six into this equation now, I'll get k over minus six. And so minus k over six is the point at which we'll find d prime, or that's the point where we cross the real axis. So this gives us now a way that we can uh, a way that we can trace the contour up until we cross the real axis. And at e, which is j infinity, we see that we actually head to zero because we have k over zero. So e prime is at the origin. So now we can trace this contour like so. This is what it looks like as we go up to from a to e. And then we'll move around in an infinite arc until we get to the bottom. And essentially we'll have e prime here, d, or sorry, we can call it e1, d1, c1, etc. Uh, so now we can just use symmetry to obtain this arc. So because we start with one pole inside of our contour over here on the left, so here we've included this pole at the origin inside of our contour. So we need to have one counterclockwise loop around the point minus one, zero. And so if the point minus one is inside this loop, then we satisfy the stability criterion. But as we increase the value of k, we'll see that this point here, let me do this in a different color, we'll see that for this point here, that minus k over 6 will get larger and larger until it's on the other side of minus 1. And so our stability requires that minus 1 has to be less than minus k over 6. So we can then just solve this inequality. Minus 6 has to be less than minus k, or k has to be less than minus 6. So for any value k less than minus 6, our system will be stable.